Thanks, everyone. So just a little bit of introduction. I'm one of those people that this morning when we were asked um, who, how far away you came, I was one of the ones that came quite a long way. So the um, problem right now is that for me it's 11.30 at night, so I've been doing my best to try and stay awake and hopefully make this an engaging presentation. But bear with me. <laughs> um, so just a bit of background. So my, um, I'm not an agilist in the true sense. I come from this from a business background. So for the last 20 years, I've been either setting up companies or helping establish companies or in management roles um, from marketing and sales and other, other things. It's only, uh, however, in all that time, I work for technology companies. So mostly I work for companies like Oracle and CA. So I've been surrounded by technology in all that time. So, and as you'll see later on, at one point I actually decided that because I hadn't done it, I thought I'd actually just see what being a CIO felt like. So, um, so I've got some hands-on experience in this uh, space, but I'm approaching this from a business perspective, not from an IT or software perspective. So anyway, just as a sort of slight, um, so anyway, my name's Andy, but you know, when, when I was here last time in, in, in India, which was uh, about seven years ago, um, there was a James Bond movie on, you know, and a uh, friend here, Daniel Craig, was uh, visiting Mumbai or Bollywood or whatever you want to call, and um, it, was, it happened to be exactly the same time. And I was staying in a hotel a bit like this one, and I think, I don't know where he was, but it must have been close by because I had about three or four people come by in the space of about half an hour saying, either, are you Daniel Craig? Or did you know you really look like Daniel Craig? And I was like, no, not at all. It's like, no, my ears aren't very similar. My nose doesn't look the same. I don't know how. It was sort of one of those really weird moments. But anyway, I thought, well, you know, so, since I'm back in India, I need to get some inspiration from our friend uh, James Bond. So I thought I'd start with some advice because, you know, obviously he knows a lot about this space. So the first thing was, why is it people who can't, Take advice, always insist on giving it. Well, hopefully that's not me here today. Second thing is uh, arrogance and self-awareness sel seldom go hand in hand. So I don't think I'm arrogant very often, except maybe. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> that's not me, by the way, I wish, but <laughs> it's my head. And likewise, even though some of you have probably seen that, that there was a sponsor here called Cooper as well. It's not me. In fact, I actually know the other, the other person. Well, I've been introduced to him by Pat, and we may be distantly related, but no, I'm not so arrogant that I have to actually be a sponsor as well. So anyway, so what? So I've done a bit of this sort of fun stuff, but what is it so what? Well, this talk is about so what. And really, really I'm going to be trying to sort of focus my effort on helping you understand what is the so what. And really, that is the essence of looking at value, is actually trying to understand what is the so what. So I'm going to spend some time, but before we do that, I'm just going to give you a bit of background. Again, I mentioned a little bit before I work for some technology companies um, and different roles. When I sort of look at you at how it came about, you know, what are the problems that I'm trying to solve? And why did I get to this point? First one was that I had a global marketing role. Now, this is the one where I in, end up being accused of being Daniel Craig or James Bond. And as part of that, I had to visit a lot of countries. I had responsibility for um, a team of 25 across uh, seven countries, including here, of course, this wonderful country in India, and across eight geographic regions. So I did a lot of traveling. Um, but that wasn't the hard part, although some would say it is. But the hard part was that we had um, part of my job was trying to satisfy the needs of all of these different stakeholders. So all of them wanted their way. They all wanted what their things. So what as being the responsible for the marketing budget, we had a reasonable amount of money we had to spend. We had to worry about all of these people's lists and requirements. And that was against a time where budgets were increasing, they were decreasing, and yet expectations were increasing. So it became very hard for us to be able to satisfy all of these different needs. How do we let them all know that their thing was being uh, uh, thought about and being considered, but it had to be in relation to the other valuable items we did as well. So we really struggled with actually how do we communicate that. And I think we had a fantastic teams, all the ones that I led, but we really did struggle with that issue. The next one, as I mentioned before, 
you know, Softed is a relatively small company, so you end up often doing multiple roles. So at one stage, as I said, I decided I hadn't been the CIO, so I thought I'll give that a try. Not a good idea. So the first thing I did when that happened was that I realized that a lot of our systems and our processes were totally outdated. So I then had this massive job of trying to update and change them. So one of them was a key client system. So we used to have systems that would record people coming on our courses or classes. And we'd also have trainers then being able to sort of put their information in. Prior to this system, it was all manual. So we would have manual forms that would come in from clients. We'd then enter them in a back-end system, very labor-intensive, very uh, fraught. Mistakes would happen and, you know, very painful for everybody. So I thought, okay, I've just started learning about Agile. Agile sounds pretty cool. I know now a little bit about Agile. We had a really fantastic Agile developer who actually teaches all these wonderful practices like XP and test-driven development and you know all these other um, wonderful buzzwords. So we thought we'll go and build, using Agile practices, this new system that will automate some of these, these issues. So we you know, very proudly did all our user stories and uh, did all the things, the coding was perfect. Um, we spent, you know, I thought we did it in pretty fast time. Um, and when we rolled it out, our clients were really happy. However, within two months, the, the key part of this, one of the features was we, we were going to give our end clients the ability to update their information themselves. Everyone had been saying, that was really important, we've got to have that. Within two months, no one had used it, no one was using it. So about 80% of the effort that we put in was totally wasted. So incredibly frustrated. Here we are doing all these wonderful agile practices. And so we've been agile, but we've still got a lot of waste. So what, what is this agile if that's still the outcome? So again, it sort of signals to me, we've got to look at it in a different way. And then the third one was actually quite recent. So we've done a lot of strategic planning and we're thinking about all the things we could do. And of course, there's always more things than you can do. So we had this big list of all these different initiatives that everyone thought were really important. Some were big, some were small, some were expensive, some were cheap. And we're all sitting there thinking, okay, where do we start? Right? And so, again, I was in my head, it was like, must be a better way. Well, thankfully, this was quite recently, and I actually learned a few things along the way. So from my time back as running the marketing and from my, as a CIO, I've been fortunate that I've actually had time to spend thinking about some of this stuff. And so this is sort of like the multiple iterations on for what I've learned. So again, I'm not an expert because that would be arrogant, but I'm here to tell you some things that I've learned. So anyway, the, the thing about in terms of there must be a better way, I sort of looked at it in three things. So how do we get people making value-based decisions? That's the first thing. So everyone starts having a language of value. How do we prevent waste? So how do we stop that issue where we lose that 80% of all that wasted effort? And how do we make this visible? So those are sort of three things that I was thinking about when, uh, when I put this together. So this is my journey. So James Bond has uh, his uh, <laughs> hobby is resurrection. So my uh, main hobby is, is mountain biking. So occasionally I fall over and have to resurrect myself from, from the ground. But that's about the closest I get to that. Um, but obviously in doing that, in doing mountain biking, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So in doing my part for New Zealand tourism, I'll show you this photo was taken uh, two weeks ago, just uh, showing the sort of, luckily, the beautiful country that I live in and what I get. But anyway, that's a little aside. So what I'm going to talk about now is the journey uh, that I sort of got to and in, uh, in how I sort of started looking at how can we solve some of these big problems. So about three years ago, I think, Pat, so... Um, um, I had the fortune of working with uh, Pat Reed sitting over there. Some of you may have sat in her session before. So Pat um, and I were brought in by a large insurance company to start educating them on the concepts of business agility. So back then, business agility didn't really exist as a term. Uh, and so I was very fortunate that I got exposed to you know Pat's many, many years of um, of thinking and working in this space. Um, and I very much sort of like to think of, of Pat as like the Yoda of business agility. So I'm, I'm in this case, I have a lot to learn and, um, and, uh, and I'm very appreciative. But anyway, so as part of this uh, cycle of business agility, so what Pat 
uh, sort of came up with is, is like a framework. And it's like a lot of frameworks. It's, you know, this looks very similar to a PDCA or, or type of thing, but it has some other little elements that I found quite interesting. First one was C, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that before. And Pat talked about that before um, in her session as well. That's a really critical element of business agility is the ability to be able to see, see things. Um, and that sounds obvious, but we obviously well, we don't often we don't see the reality of things um, or understand the complexity of them. So seeing is a critical aspect of business agility. From uh, once we see things, we then got to be able to explore our alternatives. Um, then we experiment, or if we listen to the session this moment, we maybe not experiment or try. <laughs> we listen to Liz, uh, Linda Rising's to from the information we've gleaned. We're always going to learn something. So again, we're trying to move away from this fail, you know, mentality to learn. And having learned something, then it's our obligation, in my view, as business agilists to teach. That's and that's probably one of the main reasons why I'm here today. Because I see part of my role as a business agilist is not just to hold the information to myself, but to help educate other people. Um, it's a pay forward model that I think it represents the spirit of agility and agilists. So anyway, that's part of the reason I'm here and part of the reason I enjoy working with people like Pat is that they very much have the same mentality. So then we'll come back to this believing is seeing. It's again Pat's uh, term that sort of reframes that whole thinking. So seeing is a critical aspect. So as part of that, we need to develop a whole set of new mental models. So that's a buzzword that you'll hear around a lot now, uh, mental models. But um, there's a whole bunch of new tools, some not, um, that again, I really encourage you to start sort of learning about. So uh, again, in Pat and Deborah's session today, they had a whole bunch of tools that they talked about, um, some of which are these, but this has other ones as well. Um, so, and I'm going to focus on a few. Again, we don't have time to go through all of this. It's, we wouldn't get to the really interesting bit if we did that. But I'm going to focus on a few that I found really important and helpful. First one um, is a Kinevan framework. Who here is familiar with that? Okay, uh, a good number of you, but again, I really encourage all of you, if you haven't um, understood or learnt this, it's a really important sensing tool to be able to sort of help frame and understand problems uh, and opportunities for what they are. So the, the Kinevan model is was developed by a guy called Dave Snowden, who's um, uh, Welsh, and so Kinevan is a Welsh word meaning place or habitat. Uh, and Really, it's a tool to help you figure out uh, a response to a situation you, you face um, and an appropriate response. Now, the problem right now is that most often we have uh, we respond, um, you know, w with the view that everything is simple, and so we develop simple solutions. Waterfall really is a really good example of, in a way, a simple solution. It's not that simple, but simple response to what is now obviously becoming more complicated and more complex. So when you start looking at your problems or opportunities and you start thinking about them, then this helps you come up with an appropriate response. So if we're talking about a complex problem, which I would argue most things are, we can't go in with a simple s solution. We have to uh, approach it from the point of view that we have to test always to see whether that actually is the case. So anyway, Kinevan, there's some good information that I've put uh, um, in some resources that you can look at, but I do encourage that as being an important tool that you understand. Another one, design thinking. This, in, I'm not sure in, it's so much in India, but I do a lot of work in Singapore. Uh, and right now, design thinking is sort of like this massive big buzzword. Um, is it like that here as well? Picking up, okay. Well, do you, does anyone here have an idea how long design thinking has been around for? As a concept? Two years. Two years. No, no. No, it's, it's almost as old as, as India is a republic. You know, it's, no, it's, uh, it, it's celebrated its 50th year um, this year. Now, it's been made popular by um, IDEO and the D School because they've, um, you know, they've marketed it very well. Um, but it's not a new concept. Uh, but like a lot of good concepts, it may be not new, but it hasn't been done. 
So there's what the, the, these, you know, it's come up now and it's, um, and it, for good reasons, it's a really good approach. And the key thing I think that I have get out of it, of, of this, because we have tested this and used it and I found it really helpful is, is for me it's that this bit here is often the one that's not done. So we leap into a solution or defining a solution without really understanding the problem we're trying to solve. And empathy is a really important, interesting exercise to do. So if anything, if you do design thinking, that's the one that I think you, you often gain the most value from. Then the rest of it is really just a probe, sense and respond sort of approach. Um, there's, I think tomorrow is a lot about design, so there's lots of sessions on design thinking tomorrow, so you can go along and learn more of it, but, but it is important, but it's not sufficient, is what I would say. So there'll be a lot of people here saying, you can solve all of your problems with design, design thinking. You know, if you just do that, you'll be a business agilist. And say, it's not sufficient. It's a tool. One set of tools in many that you'll need over time. Okay, so uh, the Lean Startup, so this al aligned with it too, so it came about sort of at the same time. So Eric Ries um, popularized this, you know, through his book. Um, again, it's not new, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but for me it just encouraged uh, that sort of probe sense and response sort of model of, you know, have, a t uh, have an idea, test it. Don't do big things, do smaller things. So we tried this, so we set up an office in Singapore three or four years ago, we used this sort of approach to set up the office. So again, what, I'm, what I hope I do is that I hear something interesting, I try it. That's the essence of learning is doing. It's not learning it's sitting here passively, it's trying it. And if you do it in, in this sort of mode, it's low risk. Then we come to the value engineering, which is what you all came along to learn about. So this is again something that Pat has uh, really sort of drilled, drilled into me, you know, big time that there's a couple of aspects to this. Firstly, you can actually turn this into somewhat of a science. You know, um, I'm not saying it's easy, but you can. Um, and the other key aspect is that value is always uh, as perceived by the customer, right? So whatever the customer is, you need to have that at, at its heart. So I'm going to give you an example later on where where you will see who the customer is, and that's relatively easy, but that can be quite hard because we again we're guessing what the customer values, so we need to probe and te test that. So we can actually create a uh, effectively a formula to help us to start calculating uh, value, and that's what I'm going to do. I'll show you how you can create a value model to do that, and that it's as simple as that. Ah. So. One of the key aspects that came along that really informed my thinking on this stuff was, okay, so what are, what are these a attributes of value that you look at? So in, but nearly two years ago in Harvard Business Review, uh, there was a really interesting article that came out called The uh, Elements or Dimensions of Customer Value. This was a, the result of a Bain and study, com uh, study. So Bain um, had, had been trying to solve the same thing. And they looked at um, all the different a attributes that customers valued uh, by different industries and different products. And so they came up with a list of 29 different elements and they ordered them in like a Maslow hierarchy of needs. So the lower ones have less value than the higher ones. So again, if you look at them, you probably can't see them real well. Self-transcendence is at the top, very much like the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Um, to meet that, it's pretty high because that's sort of like world changing. You know, it's like it's a world changing thing you're doing. Um, and so some organizations hold that as their key. You know, there are some organizations now that actually hold that type, type of thing as part of their vision. Then we get life changing, emotional, functional. So finally, I thought, hey, again, I've got something we can now use this common language of attributes of, of value. So that's another important aspect. Now I'll give you on later on. I'll give you access to the site. So what they do is they actually describe all of these as well. So you don't have to just go on the names. Some of them are a bit weird, so you need to look at them what they mean. But they do have a really good site that describes all of this, and it's really useful. This is an example from consumer banking. So again, Bain spent a lot of money validating this. So they didn't just come up with these as ideas. They've done a lot of customer testing. So what's really helpful there for you is that you can go on there and in different industries, they've actually got 
the main value elements for those industries. So you can pull them out. But again, I'll just say you still got to test them. Um, so that's really helpful. The other thing that was another key part of this puzzle was that part of the issue with value was the whole numbers. They're all different numbers. So some could be revenue and some could be you know, very subjective. So how do we actually start creating this common unit of, of value? And that's where, again, Pat um, and, and others who've looked at this said, ah, we can borrow from the Agile space. So in the Agile world, when we looked at stories, we don't have actual numbers. We use relative numbers. So we can use the same sort of approach. So whether we use the sort of T-shirt sizing, the dog size, or um, probably more usefully the Fibonacci type numbers, we can use these things to again start building up these these models. Um, and then we again borrowing from from uh, uh, from Agile. So we, again we worked out that if we're doing this as a group, which we should be doing to get consensus, we can use approaches like planning poker to help get people's to get um, the, the different ideas from people and make sure we agree on what is valuable. Because that's going to be important as well. Because if your view of value is different from mine, then we need to have a way to agree on that. So how do we then putting this... Uh, oh, sorry, then the last uh, um, attribute, which I also just see as another key part of this, is we need to also figure out a, a very efficient way of communicating information. So when we're evaluating these things, we need to actually um, have a very succinct way of communicating what it is we're trying to do. So the whole concept of A3 thinking, canvases, there's lots of them around. Um, but we need some way of succinctly describing what it is we're trying to value with some information that allows people to make good decisions based on that. So then we put it all together. And so we can see how these sort of elements can come together in, in a somewhat of a value uh, cycle. So we're using design thinking in Kinevin to see things. Then we're going to define, test, and evaluate the, the attributes of value. Then we're going to build a value model uh, to evaluate these. Then we're going to test them. And then we're going to learn from that. So it's a continual cycle. Okay, so that's all a bit abstract at the moment. So now we're going to actually put it into action. Okay, so I thought what what's would be a really interesting or maybe interesting but at least useful thing for me <laughs> that I, we could all understand that might be um, that will illustrate this whole concept of value planning. So anyway, so my scenario was I have a maximum of one spare day in Bangalore and I like to explore and experience the city. What should I do? This is a perfect opportunity of doing a value model and it's something useful that you can use um, uh, in the future. Uh, but it just hopefully gives you a, an idea of how this can be used to solve value-based decisions. Um, so anyway, let's go through this. So in doing that, we're going to, first of all, we're going to define what's important to me. So I'm going to go through these attributes of value and figure out what are the ones that are important to me. Remember, I'm the customer this time, so I define what's important to me. If it was another customer, I'd have to go and ask them or invalidate it. Then I look at what's available. So I see what's available, literally see, see, I've mentioned that before, we see what's available in Bangalore and what you know, glorious things there are to do here. Um, then we're going to build a value model to evaluate the options. Then I'm going to test my assumptions. And so this is an iterative thing. When I do the first pass through, um, I'll, I'll find there's stuff that doesn't look right. Um, and when it doesn't look right, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that uh, it could mean that it's come up, come up with something that, that I hadn't thought about, and I hope that's the case. But sometimes it also means that your model isn't quite right either. And I'll cover a little bit about that later on, but you know, you can generally sort of trust your, your, yourself to know whether it seems right or not. If it's oddly wrong, you've probably got one of the drivers wrong. So anyway, let's walk through it. So I've looked through all these, uh, these here. And I've now picked up uh, six, I think, drivers that, looking through this, that I think represent value for me as I'm planning my trip. So in this case, I've selected fun and entertainment, self-actualization. That's a pretty grand one, but I think that's probably the highest I can do. So how do I lift or improve myself as a person? Um, 
therapeutic value. So how do I improve my mental uh, health by experiencing the, the joys of the sights of Bangalore? Um, wellness, so part of that could be or maybe as much as like doing a yoga session or something, but it could just be the exercise I get from strolling around the, the national park. Um, saves time or distance. So, you know, that's a, how much I can do is a, is important to me. So if I have to travel a long way, then I'm not going to get as much done. So that was a factor of value to me. Um, quality. So quality was one of those attributes that Bain found is always important every, all the time. So for me, quality is, is governed by ratings. So, you know, what do other people say about this? So I was using that as one attribute, looking at TripAdvisor and various other things to see what else. And then cost. So cost is always going to be an attribute. So then I, re I went through and um, evaluated those and, and rated. So not some are more important than others. So obviously if we think about that pyramid, self-actualization should be higher than some of the others. So funnily enough it is. But again, it wouldn't have necessarily have to be if that wasn't important to me. So I've been through and evaluated all of, all of these uh, different drivers. Then the next thing is I have to then identify available options. So um, I ruled out just so that you might say, well, where's Bangalore Palace or something like that? Well, I've been to a few of them, right? So there are a few ones that I've pulled out that you may not see on the list. So I went through um, and screened and pulled out a whole bunch of different sorts of things. So there was a lot of other options available. Um, but I pulled out the ones that I thought were the most interesting based on what I find of interest to me. Um, and again, you can look through, there's some quite different, a day trip to Agra is the wild card in there, it's the bucket list type of thing. Um, I haven't actually had the chance of going there, I thought I'll throw that in there, but probably knowing it wasn't achievable, and as it turned out, it was impossible. <laughs> Couldn't get there, and back. We can get there, but not back. So that wasn't, that was out. But all these other things represented activities or things of interest to me. Okay, so then, like magic, you know, it's like one of those cooking shows, then magically all, I've, all of this all got filled in. So, but this was an iterative process. So, what you're seeing here is the result of uh, quite a bit of work. So, I didn't just magically pluck those numbers out, I had to do some work. You know, again, when you're evaluating options, you need to do the work. So, I had to go and look at, so you might say, why have we all got the uh, stadium up there? Well, I really enjoy, I like cricket, um, and I knew that RCB, that's the stadium here, so I thought, got to throw that in. Um, unfortunately, there's no IPL games at the moment, so I couldn't go and watch one of those, but anyway, that was the closest I could get to. And this, there's something else that you could tell me later on. Um, so I went through and put in all the numbers. But to do that, I had to go and look at this, the information about them, um, evaluate you know, each of these items ac across all of these different things. Um, so if it was like a distance thing, I had to actually figure out what, how far away it was. I had to actually get that. I had to figure out cost, um, quality I had to get. So there's a lot of actual things I had information I had to get before I could start doing this. And again, you can't shortcut on this stuff. You need to do that with the work to be able to make good decisions. So I, that was part of this. I went through this a few times. So anyway, this this is just raw numbers at the moment. The magic of it is when we, we actually pull it through to, so this is a spreadsheet, right? It's a pretty simple one. But I'm going to give you access to this so you can take it and use it uh, for, for the future. But what we then do is we then calculate a value score. So the value score is taking each of those individual numbers, multiplying it by the importance factor, and then adding them all up. And that gives you the, the score of 329. We then add all of those up to give a total score. right? And then the value and scale is a percentage. So 329 is 9% of 3695. Okay, so that gives us an index or value in scale score. We then do that with cost as well. So we add up all the cost items. Then we get a cost in scale. And then from that, magically, we get an index. Okay, so we get a value divided by cost. And then from that, we can then get a, a number, right? So it's a value score. From that, we've then got a, a result. We've then got something that says this is what Based on what you've said, this is the result. Uh, so again, when I did this, went through it a few times, uh, 
you know, so the result of this is not exactly how it first came out, but pretty close. Um, and it actually, when I think about it, it was pretty useful. Because what it did was it actually evaluated or removed a whole bunch of things that weren't really that important to me, um, or which that was really helpful. Uh, and it reaffirmed what I actually think is important. So when I travel, you know, when I actually thought about it afterwards, when I travel, you know, I want to experience things that are different. So a lot of the things you see on here are a lot of the more cultural sort of things, the things that are unique to this place uh, in this country, not things that I can do like a fun park, which I can go anywhere. So if that's what's important for me when I go and visit places is those things. So that's where the value is in the eye of the beholder, or in this case the customer, that's me. Um, and I thought this was actually really helpful. So simple thing, but, you, but hopefully you can see from there with a, a more other example, and then I'll give you some, some other ones, how you can take the same approach and start applying it to make value-based decisions. So anyway, I thought I'd open that up. So in the Agile world, we can still make, change our mind. So I haven't actually finalized what I'm going to do tomorrow, right? So there may be some other options that aren't on there. Now you know what I like, right? you can actually help inform me about what other things you think I could do. I'm not going to commit to doing them because I'd have to do my research, but you may have some really good ideas and I welcome hearing them. And I can make that decision at the last responsible moment, <laughs> which is tomorrow. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's that enough on that one. So how are we using this? So this, we then started using this um, at SoftEd to take that same approach. So we, we use this to help solve that investment issue. So we've got all this big list of things. Let's break it down to agree on the ones that we can that we can actually do. So we again, this is giving you the, the end point, not the start point. We started really simple, and then we realized that we needed to get it a little bit more complicated. The, the getting a little bit more complicated was we had this big list of activities, but and then we did the value scoring. People had, we're all over the place. You know, so I would score at 8 and someone else would score at 20. And the reason that happened was because we didn't give enough information about what the actual value and the cost of it was. So people couldn't evaluate it effectively. So we then learned that we had to go and do one of these initiative sheets. We had to have the discipline of documenting what was the problem or the issue we're trying to solve, what's the value of solving that, and what's the cost. And then what is the testable thing we're going to do? So getting that discipline or giving enough information gives you better results. So that was a really important learning thing that came from trying. Um, so anyway, but you don't have to, you can start like it all is, you start and try. So then we've built this into like a decision architecture. So how do we use this to make decisions? So this is like a now, just a fancy word, but the way we actually can make decisions. Um, so we use this as part of like a monthly way of evaluating new things. And then we're using a Kanban board, initiative board, to then track and monitor these initiatives. So you can put this, you take from that into a, you know, into a sort of really quite a visible way of showing what you're doing um, and learning from that as well. So this can become, you know, pretty powerful in your organization. And the key thing is that it changes the language. So people start talking about value points. They start think. The other really interesting thing that comes out of this is, you know, this morning Linda Rising was talking about, um, what was the exact words? Just, you know, I haven't got it. But, but I think it was sort of like, you know, small, fast, and cheap, basically. So frugal. Frugal, of course. How could I forget? So this model, because it, it's a value model, it actually really forces you to be frugal in a way because it will, if it's high value and lower cost, it's always going to rise up higher. So it really does support that approach that Linda was talking about. Um, you know, small, fast, high value things. It should be obvious, but um, it, it really does work. Um, for those that were in Pat's session, Pat mentioned about Intel. So Intel. Again, value engineering, value models are not new. 
a bit like the design thinking. It's not quite as old. It's not 50 years old, but it's 15 years old. So again, this isn't a new concept. It's one that's um, been around for a while. But I think what's now made it easier is the relative. You know, Intel model was quite complicated, frankly. Um, we can now simplify that, um, make it a bit easier. But the concept they had was really important and helped them, as Pat pointed out, solve some huge challenges. So the IT department turned, became, you know, went from being the department that everyone hated to one that they really uh, valued because they were show, able to show the value of what they did. So and the other one that Pat mentioned as well, I've got a few slides here. So CIA and T is a Brazilian company, um, and they have used this approach in their uh, agile work. So all of their agile projects are used building this sort of value model. So basically they build their value model, they look at the, the business capabilities that the solution is solving, um, and then they do that against all these all the different attributes at this to down to the story level. Um, and the value of, and they do that the same with cost. The value of that is that you can start you then start getting some graphs, right? That really start helping you to figure out if you talk about in the, the minimal viable products, you know, all this stuff, you can really start seeing using this model type of approach um, where either you need to do more work to explain something or you should stop. Um, so really powerful tools and techniques that can be applied across multiple different op scenarios. So if you're in the agile space, this is a name. I don't think this is if you're just starting where you want to start, but it's a, where you want to aim to. Because a lot of you will be having that same issue, figuring out what are the most highest value items to do. You can start applying this approach and you'll have um, be able to have different discussions with your customers. Okay, so like everything, this is a model. You know, models are just abstractions. They're not perfect um, and they can be abused. So, you know, um, lessons from, from some personal experience. One of the interesting ones that I've come across is that, so over-engineering is a classic one. You think, oh, it's so simple. It can't be that simple. Why? You know, we've got to, so we've got to make it more complicated. And this is actually is interesting because there's actually a bias that's built into us that almost instills us to want to make things complex. You know, uh, see, all we're doing is just making it more complex. Um, and it's not actually adding a lot of value. It's actually making it less usable and reducing, reducing the value. So there's an actual concept, and this is being used now by police forces across the world because they were like wanting to solve crime. So they're now working on this sort of Occam's razor principle, which is that you basically go with the simplest one first, um, not the most complicated one, which is, had been the, the tendency. So that's the one to look out for, is that it can't, can't be that simple. You, in your mind, you're saying, resist that. <laughs> um, and it is a complex problem, right? So... You know, if you overcomplicate it at start, you're never going to be able to figure out the bits to change. So keep it simple would be my view, and then add as you go. Um, um, otherwise, we end up going from from this to this, or he's not here, I don't think. Well, from this to that. <laughs> this is a pretty, uh, uh, I think. To me, sort of sums up this. This is again from this is a statement's been around a long time, but I think it's actually pretty apt. Um, so uh, it's a very this is a very good, even though it's 25 years old or something, is actually very much this the spirit of business agility. Now the other side of that is not enough information. So we can go we can go oh we're now agile now we don't have to have any information you know like we used to think in the agile world was we've gone from these massive you know, business requirement documents down to nothing. Well, no, that's not true. You need the minimal viable amount of information. So that's where you should at least have a canvas or something to help others understand what it is that your problem you're trying to solve. And again, this is an example of one that we've created, but there are lots of other ones around there that are that I've put on the site that you can use. Good thing about canvases is that you try and adapt, inspect and adapt. Isn't that what we talk about in Agile? Uh, and then I'll just, the other traps I see as well is, you know, we're solving the wrong problem. Again, we've probably seen that as well. 
Um, so we spent a lot of time and effort. That was my example, you know, the one where I said about where I was the CIO. Spent a lot of time solving the wrong problem. Um, great. <laughs> Not very helpful. So we spent a bit more time maybe doing the five whys and really understanding. We might have actually uncovered what the real problem is that people had. Um, and the other key part here is that defining tangible benefits is hard. Um, but it's necessary. So if you want to make people believe in this approach, you need to get good at, you know, sort of understanding what are the tangible benefits that will come from whatever you do. Um, and, def and articulate those. Otherwise, you're going to end up running into the same problem. Then the next thing is not evolving. Um, so again, we stick with what we had. So the basic model I, you know, that I started with, the shoe hiree model, again, you're probably familiar with this, we get stuck in the shoe. So we, we've done our spreadsheet and we, we stay there. We don't evolve it. We don't change. Um, that's a trap that we can fall into as well. But it doesn't mean we, used to, we go straight to har either. We, we, got to, we go through these things as we learn. In the same way, if you were, this, the shoe hiree came from martial arts. You, know, you don't become a black belt, you know, and day one you work your way up to that so it's the same principle we learn by doing um, and so again the whole concept of complex problem probe sense and respond and then you know and this is please don't do this to start but you know as you um, get better and more you can add in complexity there are a lot of other really good tools that you can start building in um, to help improve this so but you work towards that, you know. Um, otherwise, you'll just go there over engineering mode. Um, and people will stop doing it and using it. You, but if you work your way up to it, then they'll come along with you on that journey. And the other thing is that this is a, you know, you start doing this, it's a change. So not everyone's going to embrace it at first. So you need, to, well, I've found that you need to bring people along. They need to see the value of it. They need the value of value modeling and all this stuff. They don't. Um, they just think it's this cool tool you brought out, but we just carry on doing what they did before. The majority so up, you've got to treat, well I see, see that it's treating that as, you know, as, that's, as, that's why you do want to start, in my view, quite small and let them understand it and then grow from that so that they can see the value of it. Um, and that's where the lean canvas, you know, again, can be useful just for you to think through how are you going to introduce this in your organization. Uh, because it is different from what people are used to doing. So expect that they'll have some, you need to bring people along with you. So where can I start? So again, we've been through this quick review. Define your value drivers, rank the importance, build your value model experiment, and adapt. And then, then you can brought into other areas. So I'll leave with a, an invitation. So we come back to the so what. So really this was all about so what. So it's about how do we, so what is the intersection between the cost and the value. Uh, and really, I think if we start applying some of these approaches, then we can really answer that, what do we do. Just um, had, had to finish off with our, with our friend. Personal to me. So, uh, you know, I've been through a lot, a lot of things over life, but I actually think in the last three years, you know, since I've been working with Pat, I've learned more about lots of more about just about everything that I had in in the, the preceding 20 years. So, just because you're getting older doesn't mean you can't actually develop wisdom with that. So, lifelong learning is definitely for everyone. And to help with that, um, to become so you can become a value, a vanguard of value. We've actually set up a, uh, a little site, uh, which you know, must be, yeah. Of course, we had to have uh, OS7 in there. So if you access that site, uh, share some information. I'm not going to spam you with marketing stuff or anything. I am just just want to keep in contact with people. Um, then on there, there's the site. So a whole bunch of really hopefully useful resources. So I've got a little guide I put together on how to create a value model. Um, the spreadsheet example uh, and access to uh, to all of these different tools. So again, yeah, you know, hopefully you'll get a lot of value from this. Um, if you're struggling with it, let me know. I'm happy to help so out. You know, as I say, I, we see it as part of our role to help people 
on this journey. So that's uh, happy to help uh, if you are struggling with a few things. Does anyone have any questions? Said this multiple times. If all you're measuring is financial performance, you're going to be uh, optimizing no? purely for financial yeah. performance and not for yeah. customer needs. Right? The KPIs that you have, or OKRs, KPIs, outcome profiles, this yeah. is model that you want, right? needs to be focused on what does the customer want from us. Yep. Right? The financial elements are nothing more than a metric. They're an yep. indicator that yep. we are serving our customers. They are not the measure, sorry, they are not the outcome that we're trying to achieve. So there's a more fundamental issue yep. about what you're measuring and why you're measuring it. Sorry, and, and between. Around, um, yeah. When you say your, your KPI is around money. Yep. Uh, I'm going to guess your organizational scorecard also has a customer satisfaction. Most of them, right? So then you will get fired. Um, I think the main reason is that value is probably the most important thing you should think about. The customer value should be, you know, is ultimately why we're doing things. So this is, this I suppose is a prioritization tool based on what I think is the most important thing to, to worry about. Um, and that's probably how I would look at it. Sorry, any other questions? Yeah. That's the only one that really matters. Right? So the rewards and benefits of the KPIs have to be systemic at a system level, not yep. just individual. Which is, you hit this one, great. You hit the rest, that's a vice versa. Similarly, going back to why you exist, yep. right? this, this idea of measuring what, I'll give you another example, uh, and I know I'm out of time, so I'll be very quick. Yep. I used to work for IBM, and I probably should say this, but I'm going to anyway. We made a change to the account model of how we operated with some of our big clients. Um, big, big vendors have accounts. Well, I think that sellers, it would, to my mind, it's probably a longer, a longer answer. <laughs> but I think if you work through this, so if you start looking at what are the, what are, if you start defining what's of value to your customer, um, this is a journey you need to work through. So you wouldn't do this in isolation. You would work through this with the people that you're trying to work, you know, your customers, right? Um, bringing them along. So they would help agree with what's of value. And we give those KPIs to our folks. Yep. So this changed the behavior. Yep. And yes, they still have to sell a certain amount. Sure. But sure. I'm now no longer selling. And risk, products. actually risk is another I'm attribute. And in, in the full model, you'll see risk is another one we, we would add in as well. You're yep. trying to achieve a certain, uh, you're trying to yep. release a new product, a new banking product to market. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. That is my KPI. Well, you add in, actually risk goes along with cost. Is what we're going to do. My bonus. Yep. Relies on. So you, what, but what happened is risk, risk becomes like a multiplier to cost, so it makes the cost higher. And so what, you'll have a risk, like a risk index. And so some items are, have more risk than others. So that'll become an attribute of the cost. I can show you in the model, but you effectively weight the cost higher based on the, the risk. And so that weights that lower because the cost is higher. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'm not completely out of time. If you have any questions about what we're doing,